That's Lindsey Gay's his son, and he averages <laughs> 40 points a game. I was like, really? And then he's like accumulates points. And so it was after halftime he had 20, and I, I didn't realize he had that many. And he had probably 40 points against us. But Shane, different type of, these guys are friends, but they're different types of personalities. I'm giving you a little background on these guys before we start opening it up to questions. Shane is 17, gives our team, the Sydney Kings, 29. And at the end of the game, you would think, you know, he's just got himself into the league. He's played at the AIS, hits a shot, goes by our bench and just pumps his fist like, yeah, I got a lot more of that coming for you if you want some. So very interesting characters. They've got some great stories and hopefully we can share some, some of those stories with you today. Steve, you, you left out a very important part of that uh, little story you told with Shane is that he had the tightest shorts on in the history of shorts. I did. I mean, these things were like leotards. I took pride in that. I, know. <laughs> I actually enjoyed the fact and the just, just really, really tight. The only player when he get his uniform, he'd get his shorts, go home, throw them in boiling hot water and dry them in the oven, just so they really hug. Well, one step further than that, I had the Fabergés back in the 80s, and I'd have to lay on the bed to actually get the Fabergés on. Not was the it? 80s. Not the, uh, the stone wash numbers. The set no, I wasn't shape. stone wash at that stage. <laughs> oh, that's, that, that was a little like later in life. Oh, right. Okay. right. But they were tight. When yes. you're Victorian mm. and you grow up playing footy, <laughs> yes. you're going to have the tight footy shorts. <laughs> now, who would have days of Warwick Kappa. <laughs> who would have thought? I've known this man 30 plus years. To this day, I don't actually know what colour his hair really is. <laughs> I don't know what colour my hair is. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, he... Um, but it's we've all, even I who um, perhaps couldn't pull the look off. Is but if you're going to go out there, you have to look good. Even if you can't play for shit, you must go out there <laughs> Hold and on. look good. <laughs> I think that's insinuating you saying I couldn't play. No, no, they were saying even if you can, it doesn't matter who you are, you, you could play, my friend. No, no, Dad, that uh, we don't have to go through this with this uh, very learned audience right here. But Steve. We interrupt. Oh, my apologies. Was that an interruption? I was just about to go sit down. <laughs> it's the easiest money I've ever made. Not that I'm getting paid for this. You don't have to. Um, you were talking about the rims. Let's talk about this great spectacle. They had to bring these rims in, Andrew, uh, especially yeah. for this game. Why don't you yeah, tell that's us right. About that? And um, these rims, they're, they're a certain standard. There's a um, requirement, fever requirement from where the base is to where the rim is. And with the NBA coming in, that uh, they needed a specific rim and, and, uh, and support. So these rims came in, and it's one of the legacies that come from such a, a great game and an occasion like this, is that they've got these rims, and, um, and yeah, especially brought in for this game. And they'll go back to, to maybe a Melbourne United, or they might go to Sydney and be used uh, ongoing. But if it wasn't for this game, we wouldn't get these. And these little items here aren't particularly cheap. So it's a fantastic legacy for the game. And the only other things too is when you see it, and uh, Shane was shooting around uh, a little bit earlier on, unfortunately in our area, we didn't really have to have to worry about the rim because we're straight in, nothing we caught. <laughs> but, um, but if you see it, they are a little, there's a certain um, rigidity that a rim needs to be. And they are really, really tight. And, and last night we saw that with some of the shots. They were very unforgiving. Unfortunately, it was uh, more forgiving for the United States team than it was for the Australian team. But no, they um, are fan fantastic rims. And uh, when you come into a venue like this, the first thing we would do is just have a look at the rims and you need to fall in love with the rim. If you're a shooter, if you come into the gym and there's just a little thing not in place, it can play on your mind. And uh, Hammer, you were, uh, he just put on a clinic before. Yeah, it was some of the most extraordinary stuff here. The kids were eight. Didn't, didn't, <laughs> didn't miss. Um, but uh, these, are, these are fantastic rims. Hammer. You guys understand my pain? I asked him to explain the rims. That was 10 minutes ago. Well, we've got to put some uh, context around it. It's, uh, you know, pretty bland if we just say there. Well, just, I, I had the, um, the pleasure of talking to Alan Houston and Tim Hardaway, and they played at the olympics in 2000 and i was talking to them about their olympic experiences and so they were like well yeah we we did play in that one but you've got two olympians that have nine olympic games behind them between these guys am, am i wrong five and four you didn't get five 
I remember once I said, I, I, I was doing a Q and A. My dad wasn't the coach. <laughs> I was doing a Q and A with Shane, and I said uh, three, because I just thought, wow, that's you know, that's a lot of years. And he was like, you know, four. Made it very clear that he was that he had done four. It's four years of my life, mate. Okay, like, you, you know, you're still upset with me about that. Yeah. All right, anyway, all of these seats in this arena, you guys have played five Olympics, four Olympics. You played in the NBA, both of you. You played in the Final Four. Uh, Andrew, and what is this compared to any of the places that you've played in the world through your basketball travels? Because you guys have chalked up a lot of places over a lot of years. Yeah, we have. Um, I mean, it's unique. It's not obviously designed for basketball. I didn't ever think that, you know, dreaming of playing for Australia that at any stage that basketball in this country would have 55,000 people watching the Boomers play against the USA. It's just something you just don't think could happen. Uh, and when you walk into this venue and you see it raised and you see all of the seats, it's a, it was a great day for basketball yesterday. And it shows how far we've come and the popularity of the sport from a junior level, the amount of people that are playing it. And I walked in with a whole lot of pride and, uh, and I was excited to watch the guys play. And I thought we actually did really well last night and I think is all of this great are you going tomorrow it's tomorrow's game yeah, yeah I, I think that we've seen improvement from the boomers over the last seven days I was a bit worried about where they were at last week against Canada to be honest with you I was like wow we're uh, this isn't a team that's going to win a medal but in seven days we actually showed improvement and hopefully tomorrow they actually are one step closer as well but let's not forget they're playing against the the world's best back to your stadium in the NBA, there's 20, 25,000 seats, and it's unbelievable everywhere you go. But there's nothing like this. Basketball isn't played like this unless it's a Final Four game for college. Well, another one of the questions that I asked the NBA guys last night was, when did they know, when did they feel like they could play at that level, could play in the, in, in, in the NBA? I know it's unique for both of you guys because back then, players weren't just playing ball in Australia and had a pathway. There was no direct pathway to the NBA when you guys were playing, well, who am I kidding? I'm older than you guys, when we were playing. I'm not trying to make you guys sound old, even though. Yeah, no, that's quite all right. Okay, all right. all right. So anyway, so what was it like to, when did you know that you could play at the NBA level? Well, for us, when we were growing up, uh, and you guys here would understand, uh, these days you, you can pick up your phone and watch an NBA game. You can, on any, during the summer, you, well, if you've got Foxtel, you watch an NBA game, you watch a college game, you watch a Euro League game, you watch an NBL game. There's so many different ways in which you can access uh, the sport, and in particular, uh, the NBA. When I was growing up, and I'm a little bit before Hammer, not a lot, but a little <coughs> bit before Hammer, um, I can still remember when I was a, a teenager, getting a, a Sports Illustrated that was six months old, coming there's a, an american who'd come over and you go to their house and there's a, a an old sports illustrated and and looking at photos of, of larry bird or, or magic johnson um so the the nba really wasn't on my radar when i put my head on the pillow and thought of something magical or heroic i could do as i lay in bed preparing to uh, uh think of those fanciful dreams that you have uh, mine was never about playing for the Boston Celtics or the LA Lakers or the San Antonio Spurs. My heroic dreams and the most important thing you could ever do in basketball was hitting the winning basket for Australia to win a gold medal at the Olympic Games. That's what rocked my boat. And that was the most prestigious, highest honor you could have. So I never grew up with an ambition or a desire to play in the NBA. And um, it was just through good fortune rather than anything, that uh, being in the right place at the right time, I came through an era when the sport was just going gangbusters here. And uh, throughout the late 80s, when guys like Steve came in in the 90s, and the standard of basketball here rose to a level, uh, eventually the word filtered out throughout the world, and they started to look at players um, over here. When I first, my first opportunity in the NBA was um, back in 1993, when I played uh, you people here would refer to them as the Washington Wizards, but I guess it's an indication of how old I am. They were actually called the Washington Bullets uh, back then. And uh, when I went there, it was, it was something 
that um, for me it was just an experience to to go and play and and um, it, what it did do getting to your point Steve is that when you I actually went over there and I was only there at the end of the, the, the season I was there for a month but to spend some time with that group and the team regardless of what anyone else ever thought what it did, it, it did satisfy in my mind that not only me, but there are many, many people throughout the world that have the capacity and the ability to play at that level. When I was at the Washington Bullets, there might have been 10 maybe foreign players in the league, something like that, 10, 11, because they weren't even looking overseas for talent to play in the NBA. Now you have hundreds of of foreign players and some of the, and the best player in the world in regards to the current MVP is not an American. This is the very first time that I can remember in recent history that the best player at the World Cup won't be an American. It's a Greek, Giannis Antetokounmpo. Uh, so it, we've come a, a long, long way. And for me, getting to the crux of your question, it was more just in the right place at the right time, not because of a boyhood dream or of an ambition uh, to play at that level. Well, it's right place at the right time. I think you're being very modest, right place at the right time, but you took advantage of that opportunity. Would you agree with that? Well, I, my, my time when I was with the San Antonio Sports came a, a, a lot later. I was 34 years of age. Um, you know, Hammer could probably speak more to it because his contribution to the NBA is far more than what I did. Now, I might get accolades because I just happened to be on a team that won, the, and then when you talk about right time and right place, happened to be on a team that won a title. But if you look up, if there was a dictionary of NBA players, and one of the categories in that dictionary said, who is the most irrelevant player to be on an NBA championship winning team? There would be a happy, content photo of me like this saying, I was there. Because I, my role was not very significant at all. Shane had a, Hammer had a, a much uh, more significant uh, role with his team than uh, with the Minnesota Timberwolves than I had with the San Antonio Spurs, it's just that I was in the very good fortune to be with some superstars of Tim Duncan and David Robinson and um, Steve Kerr, the assistant coach, the head coach of this team, Greg Popovich, he was uh, won his first title that year. So I was just in the right place at the right time. Happy to go on that gravy train, but uh, someone here was asking, well, do, you, do you wear your championship ring? I do not boast about, and it's somewhat embarrassing when people mention, oh, you're an NBA champion. Well, I was there, but that's, Really, all it was. <laughs> you're up, you're up, Shane. From there, mate. <laughs> <laughs> well, different pathways, Shane. Like, you more or less carved the way for somebody that wasn't going to go to college over there. Luke Longley went to college and played in New Mexico and then made it into the NBA. But you made it in a completely different way and talk about seizing the opportunity dropping eight threes against the U.S. Dream Team in Atlanta was a pretty good indication that you were ready to play in the NBA. Well, uh, just like Drewy, I didn't aim to play in the NBA. And even though I'm a little bit younger and came through a little bit after Drewy, um, it wasn't something I dreamed of. I, I told my dad when I was 12 that I was going to play for Australia. And that was our dream, our, our together. That's what we dreamed about. That's what motivated me in the driveway and I'm listening to Drewy tell his story and I used to do exactly the same thing you, like as a player you you learn to visualize being successful and I'd be in the driveway and I learned to commentate at the same time and I'd be like heels got the ball playing against America down by two three two one whack go down I'd be blowing kisses to fans I'd be signing autographs other times I'd do the same thing I'd go three two one it misses yeah half time it was great. I never lost. I never, ever missed a game winner. But you do. You just dream of being in that situation. It was a passion. And even when I was lucky enough to go on to the NBA, that was, was something that we were very fortunate to be able to do for a job. And you loved it and loved the opportunity. And I played in Greece for three years and played in Italy for a year as well. Coming back and playing for Australia was something totally different. You do it and you sacrifice your time. You're not getting paid 
you're away from your family and you love every minute minute of it because of the passion that you have to play for Australia. Um, I was very fortunate through playing for Australia and a lot of it playing with this man here. He's he, we know he's he, as humble as he is, but I was lucky enough to room with Drewy for three of my four Olympics. But it, it made my job so much easier as a point guard. He was one of the greatest scorers in the world, and no one will do what he's done in the NBL scene. He averaged over 40 points on numerous seasons. Not the the amount of Australians that have had 40 points in a game isn't very many. He averaged 40 points per game for how many seasons? Three or four? Five? More? I don't <clears throat> All right. So I was very lucky coming in, being able to look up to somebody like Andrew, but then be in the backcourt with him and, and, uh, and start with him. So it took a lot of pressure off me because I had somebody that was such a great scorer. A lot of the pressure and the scouting reports and everything is about how you stop Andrew Gaze. It was easy for me to sneak under the radar a little bit and to be able to make some shots and get some assists. And we ended up forming a pretty good backcourt considering the way we sort of look and lack of athleticism and, and, and all the rest of it. But uh, yeah, lucky to go to the NBA, lucky to get a taste of it. And things are certainly different now. I speak to kids now that some kids that aren't very good and they tell me that they're going to the NBA. It's just what they believe they're going to do. Uh, a different mindset. I'd never, ever thought that, never dreamed of it, uh, but fortunate enough to be able to taste it. Well, like I said, I've been fortunate enough to know these guys for a number of years. And over the years, they've told me a couple of stories. So they're going to have to retell these stories. And I'm sure you guys mm. will enjoy these stories. But Hopefully, um, I'm not going too deep in the <laughs> archives, uh, Steve. Well, let me, go, let me go with Shane. You know in that game where you had eight threes against the U.S. team, where everybody remembers the Charles Barkley you know, shoulder charge. But people don't remember that he had eight threes in that game. How many of those did you get? Like freebies, because you were saying, oh, they, they knew about Andrew Gaze, but they didn't know about you. How many rhythm threes did you get off before they isn't, realized, I better guard isn't you? Isn't that so Australian? That was 23 years ago that we played against the, the dream team, and they were the real dream team back then. We walked into to Utah, but I still have somebody every day that will come up and go, I remember that game against the dream team. And I reckon 19 out of 20 of them go, yeah, you uh, bumped and talked trash to the dream team. No one remembers I had eight threes. None. Um, and I have a bit about it. They don't, very some bitter. people don't even remember that it was Charles Barkley. <laughs> some people go, yeah, yeah, you know that big guy, uh, Shaq O'Neal. <laughs> but um, no, I, I think I, I, I was feeling that at that time we were playing the NBL season. So we would go into our camps and we would have like a week-long camp in between our NBL games. So we were in the flow of it. When, and I was feeling really good in 1996 playing for the Sydney Kings. I had another great uh, backcourt partner called Isaac Burton. Where I was shooting the ball really well. So I felt like we had a really good flow. And we went into that game, stepped on the court, and the bright lights open up. You're playing against the best in the world. And a lot of the times we saw some of our opponents that would play against the dream team and they would get in the team's autographs they were getting photos with them and we looked at it and were like listen we love these blokes they are the best in the world no doubt about it can we beat them probably not but we're going to have a crack we're not getting their autographs we're not getting photos so we're going to have a go and they didn't like it they didn't like it at all there wasn't a whole lot of respect so when we started dropping some threes and you get in that zone and for shooters if you make your first three it, it's the best feeling and you just believe you're going to make the next one and then you believe you're going to make the next one if you miss your first three or four threes it's a very difficult thing to get yourself back on track to get hot so i made my threes and i made the most of it after that well andrew you, you always talk about things and you always play them down but you're you have been fortunate mm -hmm. in your timing you know with your nba championship oh, ring. and Andrew played one season at Seton Hall. And I played college basketball in our dream, you know, like when I was in the yard and the shot was shot clock was winding down to three, two, one. It was me hitting a shot, winning the NCAA championship, getting to the final four. Andrew plays one year with <laughs> Seton Hall and he's in the final four and in the final game. So tell us a little bit about that ride going to Seton Hall. Yeah, for college basketball is huge and um, conferences all over and then they accumulate into the NCAA tournament at the end of the season where 64 teams come 
and uh, it's, I think it's 68 these days, but at the time it was only 64 back then. And uh, you, it comes in, it's a sudden death tournament. And uh, went through, I went to Seton Hall straight after we finished the Seoul Olympic Games campaign. And what happened there was, is that um, I was asked to go play Seton Hall. Uh, we did a tour with my club team, the Melbourne Tigers, and we played against all the schools in the Big East uh, Conference in 1986. And straight after the game against Seton Hall, the coaching staff came to me and said, can you stay on right now? So this is November of uh, 1986. Can you stay on and come to school, study and be part of our team? And because I was always about trying to play for Australia, I'd just been uh, to the World Cup in, in 86 and uh, we didn't do so well. And, and it was going to mean that I couldn't play the following season uh, in the NBL. It, it didn't line up. Uh, so I said no, and then they kept, the, the coaches there kept on me every year. For the next few years, they were asking me, "Can will you come? Now, again, just as the fickle hand of fate works in a mysterious way, because if those coaches had given up, I would never have had that experience, because I wasn't pursuing a college career. Uh, and then finally, because of the Olympics in 1988, the NBL started their season early, because we used to play in the winter. So it started in, in February, went through, and it went back to its normal time of starting in April the following year. So this opened up this window of opportunity for me to go and play at Seton Hall and be a student. The other thing is, uh, I was studying. I was doing a Bachelor of Applied Science course at Victoria University. And because of the Olympics and the World Cup, I was missing a lot of school. So I thought, sweet, here's a chance to go get a couple of semesters in of study, help with my credits to, uh, to get to uh, graduate from Victoria University. And just a little sidebar on that, uh, uh, I was at Victoria University, I started in uh, 1985. To do a Bachelor of Applied Science course, it takes you, it, it normally takes you three years, three and a half if you're a bit tardy. It took me, 11 years to finish a Bachelor of Applied Science course. Now, uh, they only give you 10 years. After you've done 10 years, normally they say, no, you, 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 you're out. I had to go to appeals committees and all those things to get an extra year. So fair to say, studying was not high on the priority list when I was doing that other stuff. So all those things came together and I said, yep, I'm gonna take up uh, this opportunity. We were picked to finish seventh in a nine team conference we would pick to finish seventh and straight after the Seoul Olympics we went there and we're playing some pickup games before we started official practice and I'm thinking my goodness if we're picked seventh this has got to be this is an NBA um, type situation because they were so good and and sure enough they were really really good one of the other great players on the team was a Puerto Rican who I just uh, Ramon Ramos who I just played against because he represented Puerto Rico in Seoul. So we went about it, had a fantastic season, went all the way through to the championship game. We played uh, Michigan, uh, University of um, uh, Michigan in the, uh, in the final game. And in a venue like this, it was the Kingdome in Seattle. There's 45,000 people in a football stadium just like this. Uh, we played the semi-final against Duke. We beat them by 20 in the semi-final. So we're in the grand final, to use Australian terms, uh, for the, this game against uh, Michigan. We play this game. It goes to overtime. We're playing in overtime, and we are one point up. And we have a possession. Shot clock runs out. They're bringing the ball down the floor. We're one point up. One of the, Ramil Robinson was their point guard, goes driving through and gets just almost to the keyway and the referee calls a foul in one of the worst <laughs> officiating decisions in the history of this sport. It was a howler. And here we are, one point up, and they call it, we, we call it, and he's got, because they're in the bonus, there's, he's got uh, a one and one. So if you make the first, you get the second. He's going to the free throw line. We call a timeout to try and what you call ice the shooter, get him thinking about the, the shot to try and put him off. Ramil Robinson was a 54% free throw <laughs> shooter. 
all right, in front of 45,000 people at the Kingdome, and we're in there. He misses one of those. We get the rebound. We win. He makes one. We go. We we'll probably go to overtime. He makes both. We're in real bad trouble because there's only three seconds left. So we're in a city. Imagine this stadium full like it was last night. And this is the outside of the Olympic Games in the United States, a little unknown fact, or it certainly was back in 1989. Outside of the Olympic Games, the NCAA Final Four is the most watched television sporting event in the country. More than the Super Bowl, more than the NBA because they're over seven, the most one-off games. So we come out of that free throw and Ramil Robinson's at the free throw line. And we're lined up, so Ramiro Robinson shooting a free throw, and he's here, and we're lining up there. And the stadium's full. I, there, there is thir just a city of cameras right here to take a shot of Ramiro Robinson to get this photo, see what's going to happen. And I'm there, and I'm waiting, and I'm thinking, well, how do I put this guy off? So I'm sitting here, hands down, Shit, Ramil. Camera's uh, there. Uh, this magical moment, trying to build up the pressure and the anxiety that he's going to face. Now, I'm a very, very competitive beast, but I'm also probably a little soft. And in that particular moment, after I've uttered those words out, I've looked up and got an understanding. Here is a guy, if he misses these free throws, that will be regarded as one of the, the worst things that could happen to him as an individual. Every single paper, media outlet is gonna remember this one moment. And in my own head, I come to the point and I thought I started to think, well oh, shit, maybe just make one. <laughs> maybe just make one, we go to overtime and then we, we figure it out. I had a sense of, of appreciation for how his life would be if he missed both those shots. It would have a transforming impact. Now, unfortunately, it had a transforming impact the other way because he didn't hold up his end of the bargain and he made them both. And he, he, uh, they went a point up and they end up winning. Now, at the time, I didn't think too much of the, of, of the particular call. I never, ever went back and I've never, I never watched that game uh, again. Went back, we were very humble in defeat. Our coach showed all class, PJ Carlissimo. Uh, six years ago, six years ago, it was the 25th anniversary of that particular moment and the school put together this DVD that summarized the whole season, this journey that we were on, all those things. And they sent me this DVD and I thought, I need to have a look at this. And it went in there, and probably for the first time in 25 years, I saw that horrific <laughs> call that was made in the dying seconds. And 25 years later, I was way more angry and upset and disappointed than I was at the time. Now for me, the, uh, the experience, and right now, it's regarded as one of the all-time greatest grand final games in the history of college basketball. Uh, and it's and I still, three years ago, look at me, grey hair, you know, how could you, I had a few dusty little greys back then, even when I was a younger man, but with it, I was, just to, as an illustration of the impact of the NCAA tournament, I arrived in Los Angeles, okay, and then I had to get a connecting flight, and you've got to go through all the security. I put my bags to, to, to check your, la your, your carry on through the security. As I'm going through, the, the guy that was checking me looks at me, he goes, hey, you're that gaze guy, aren't you? And I'm thinking, oh, well, maybe he's a real student. Maybe he saw me a few years ago at, at San Antonio. You're that gaze guy that shot it for Seton Hall back in 1989. How in the world? Oh, sorry, Andrew. How in the I, world? I give Shane a hard time. Twenty-five for the worst or twenty-six. Accent, I think she you sorry, but uh, you know what I mean. But but that's the impact and an example of how powerful this NCA tournament is, 
and I feel incredibly indebted and grateful for that experience now that's a very long-winded answer but it, it's something that i no. love talking about because it was such a remarkable and privileged one year like he's talking about you think of all the great players that try to do it and bugger me somehow or other right place at the right time and it was just an incredible experience you know it's also incredible that man right there had his phone up the entire time you were talking he's running out of data that is a tremendous feat um, let me go out to the audience and if you have a question just raise your hand I'll give you the microphone all right you're sitting in the front row makes it easy here you go thank you guys uh, you know one of the best Brazilian players of this generation Marcos Lozada DD has already signed uh, with Cine Kings yes I want to know if you have already played with Brazilian players and what do you think of this new generation of players? I don't think, I, I'm not sure that I've played. You played against the great Oscar. Well, no, I played against Brazil. We went Oscar Smith. And if I might sound a little self-indulgent, but I got sent something the other day. Oscar Smith has made more threes than any other player in Olympic history. Number two is this man. And I snuck in the third spot. But Oscar Smith, we, 1996, we played against Brazil. The game went to double overtime, didn't it? Yes. Massive game. Oscar Smith, I think he might have averaged 20 to 22 three-point attempts. He was suited. He was so far before his time. Because the three-point line now, he would have scored a lot of points in the NBA. He was a superstar. Um, the young fellow that's coming out here now, I know very little about him. Do you? I've seen highlights of him. And um, had a, he played in the Brazilian National League last year. Good athlete. Got drafted early in the second round. Uh, a 2-3 man can shoot it. Very, very good athlete. Um, but I've only seen highlights of him. And those highlights, though, look great. But... Honestly, even right now, Hammer and I could put a good... T we could go out here and shoot some shots right now and we would look spectacular in a highlights package. So you've got to keep it in context. But clearly, if you're, you're an early... I think it was number 34, 35 pick, you might know. Something like that. It was a very high second round pick. If you're getting picked that high, uh, you, you're in good shape. And for those to put a comparison to it, do you remember a few years ago a guy named James Ennis? Played for uh, the Perth Wildcats. Well, he he uh, was in this exactly the same situation. Early second round draft pick, come to Perth, won a title, went back, and has been a, uh, in the NBA ever since. And and he'd be looking to do the same. Are there any other questions? We got time for. So, which one of you three should coach the tenth NBL team? The tenth NBL team. I think we'd be a good package. I reckon, look, if we put, a, put a, all three of us uh, in, we'd mix it up. I think we'd, uh, we'd have all bases covered. Good that Tassie's getting a team, though. Yes. Yeah. Eh? I'm very... Yeah, yeah, they're coming in next year. I'm very excited that Tasmania's going to have their own team. Not like the AFL, where they're paying Victorian teams all this money to come down there and play. No one's really going to get behind that. They've got their own team. They're doing it the right way. They're going to build it. And they're coming into the NBL at a perfect stage. Like the momentum is really building. The quality of the league is really building. So I'm excited for them. Okay. Well, you guys would have to do all the work. And I could just go around and play golf. Because in Hobart, I'm Tasmanian royalty. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this man here, when he first came to Australia, his very first team playing for Dave Ak uh, Atkins was the head coach, and uh, Jeff, what was your other import, uh, Steve? Jeff Akers. Jeff Akers, white guy, 6'9", could shoot it, but this man here, he got the name Mr. Magic for the very, very sharp work he did in that, uh, in that first season. And just by the way, I'm not picking on anyone because each to their own, if anyone was going to rival this man for the tight shorts, my man Steve Carfino, he might have even taken it to a new level. Well done, Steve. Uh, hey, Gazy, um, yeah. you, you both had a privilege of working with some pretty amazing coaches. 
Did you pick up anything from Pop which you used in your coaching? Of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah, both Shane and I, you, you don't forget, Shane played yeah. for the Spurs as well for a, a brief period. So we both had experience uh, experiences with the Pop. And, um, and yeah, absolutely. In my last three years, I, I, you draw on all those experiences. I, I used to think back and every now and again I'd say something and say, geez, that's Barry Barnes, or I'd say, oh, that's something my dad would say, or, oh, that's PJ Carlissimo. And, and you refer back to all those coaches. But during those tough times when we had some difficulties, um, that I would think, now, what would Greg Popovich do in this circumstance? And I'd try and channel that to the, to the best of my abilities. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, when you're coaching, you've got to be your own person. You take all these little bits from everyone else, and for me, obviously, the biggest influence was my dad, but you take all these little bits, you try and mold them together, but if you try too hard to be something else, I think you're gonna get found out. You are what you are, you take those experiences, you put your own personality uh, on the team, and uh, let the cards fall where they may. All right, that's about all the time we have for these guys, can you put your hands together for Shane Hill? Thank you. Hey, enjoy. Go, uh, Boopa. Boopa? Enjoy Love tomorrow. It. It'll be a great game. Okay, but we do have time for you guys to come up on the court. We get a photo op. Remember, if you've got heels on or if you've got shoes that'll scuff up the court, uh, you're going to have to take your shoes off. But we do have time to take some photos out on the court right now. If you could just make your way in this direction.